Hello and welcome to another episode of the Realm of Unknown. Today we'll be discussing another university campus, looking into the sightings and reports of paranormal mishaps. We'll be discussing the University of Tampa, which, similar to back in the very first episode of the podcast with the uh, Temple University, it has a rather personal connection. I went to Temple, I graduated last year, and my brother is actually currently enrolled within this school, the University of Tampa. So it's sort of neat to look into these locations that have a sort of personal tie, and I sort of like looking into college campus ones because it's rather unique in the stories that they provide. But before we get into the actual history and then the stories themselves, I do want to run a quick little promo for the Three Spooked Girls podcast, a similarly themed podcast who I believe I ran a promo for in the past as well. They're really great, so if you guys are interested in these sort of topics and discussions, then definitely be sure to go check them out and listen to the promo right here. Hey guys, my name is Tara. And my name is Jessica, and together we co-host the podcast, Three Spooked Girls. If you love the paranormal, or murder, join us every Monday as we tell our listeners about a new spooky tale or true crime case. We'll have a special drink recipe each episode picked out by me for you to enjoy while we scare the hell out of you. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever the hell else you listen to podcasts. Come hang out with us and get your spooky on. Welcome back, and with this, we shall be getting into the history first, and like always, and then getting into the ghost stories that are tied into the specific location. So the University of Tampa was founded in 1931, but the history of the location does go a bit further back. The centralized building of the campus, being Plant Hall, was originally constructed by Henry B. Plant in 1891, and before being purchased by the university, the building was known as the Tampa Bay Hotel. However, we are going to be discussing in that specific history of the building in a little moment. We'll get into the more specifics as we go through. So the private university was founded by Frederick H. Spalding back in 1931, all in an effort to serve as one of the area's first institutes of higher education within the Tampa Bay area. Two years following this is when the university transferred its location and made the Tampa Bay Hotel as a part of its central point. And after the move, Spalding decided to expand the school even further. The school went from being known as the Tampa Junior College into becoming the University of Tampa that it is today, with the old hotel building being renamed into Plant Hall in honor of its founder. During the next decade or so, the university would continue to grow its prestige and notoriety. However, during the time, and pretty much stretching well into the 90s, the private university also faced a whole lot of financial turmoil. They had a lot of ups and they had a lot of downs, and for the most part, it remained pretty much that way throughout a lot of the university's history. Everything else about it, though, is rather commonplace for a private institution such as this. As it stands today, it still remains pretty well known as a local institution and is rather notable national and uh, internationally as it houses a wide variety of business and science degrees that people sought after. As it stands right now, a little over 9,300 students are in attendance from all over the country and a few hundred foreign countries as well. Moving on though, uh, from the university itself again into Plant Hall, which is going to be the bulk of a lot of things that we will discuss in this episode. As it stands today, this building, again Plant Hall, sits in the epicenter of the university's campus, partially converted into classrooms and faculty rooms, while the rest of the building itself was converted into the Henry B. Plant Museum. All of this was in an attempt to capture the memory and history of the original Tampa Bay Hotel. So between the years of 1888 and 1891, the hotel was constructed by Henry B. Plant, who was a wealthy railroad owner at the time and within the region. In total, the Tampa Bay Hotel cost around $3 million to build. Now, conversion rates are really, really hard to do once they get past, like, the 1910s or so, but giving a rough estimate of that for this conversion point, um, the hotel would have cost around $78 million in today's money. And again, this is a conversion point that is 
you know, 20 years earlier than what it should be. The hotel itself covered six acres and was a quarter mile long, and it was even the very first uh, building to have an installed elevator down in Florida, which is still functioning to this day. The hotel and all of its rooms are also known as the first ones in Florida to be equipped with electrical light bulbs and telephones. So due to this, along with several other, let's just say, elegant and exquisite utilities, uh, the price of the rooms at the hotel ranged anywhere from $5 to $15 a night. Now that may seem rather significant, but once you put into perspective the fact that an average room at Tampa uh, and other locations costs around $1.25 to $2. So this was the prestige of the prestige when it comes to hotel living. When it came to operating the hotel between the years of 1891 and 1930, the Tampa Bay Hotel saw thousands and thousands of guests, with several being well-known individuals and notable celebrities as well. Some of the notable figures uh, who stayed in the hotel during its prime were nurse and founder of the American Red Cross, Clara Barton, the Prince of Wales, Winston Churchill himself, and even Babe Ruth, who actually signed his first baseball contract in the dining hall of the hotel. And during the Spanish-American War, Henry Plant actually converted uh, the hotel to the United States military to use as a base of operations, and during which several high-ranking officers did stay there during the time to create invasion plans for the war, and one of these officers was Colonel Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders who happened to stay in the hotel during this time frame. There's something actually, something else I would like to mention, especially since we'll be discussing the paranormal reports in a moment. So between the years of 1889 and 1891, Henry Plant himself traveled pretty much all throughout Europe, collecting objects in order to garnish his newly made hotel. So much so that his collection actually was said to arrive by the train loads. He actually purchased so much uh, that the massive hotel that he constructed could not hold it all and they actually auctioned off a lot of it. However, after purchasing the hotel by the university, most of the remaining artwork was removed, but a few of them were located into the museum section of the building. I mentioned all of this because, as you listeners may know, and if someone interested in the paranormal is knowledgeable, sometimes paranormal claims can be linked to objects of value or uh, sentimental significance. So a wide collection of objects gathered from across the globe, all converging on the exact same spot. And since the plant hall is the most notably haunted or allegedly haunted area here in the campus, it could possibly be an explanation as to why. But now that we've wrapped up the history of the Institute and the primary building that would be involved, from now on we shall be moving into the real meat of the episode. I'm sure what all of you guys have been coming here to listen to, the paranormal claims. I shall be providing some additional info here and there when it comes to the reports, as just they're more specific to each one, and I just don't want to bombard it too much into the history aspect of things. And I do kind of want to move on to the paranormal, because they are interesting. So first, let's start off, however, with one of the more prominent spirits known onto the campus, this being the spirit of a young woman named Bessie. Believed to possibly, possibly be the woman named Bessie Savily, who supposedly haunts folk theater after taking her own life in either the 1920s or the 1930s. As the story goes, Bessie was a jilted lover and actress within the theater back when it was a vaudeville or cinema for locals. Some accounts have her killing herself backstage, while others have her doing it in the changing room located up on the third floor. But all the stories do have a common similarity with her killing herself, particularly with her hanging herself. All of this after she found her lover cheating with her with another woman. That being said, Bessie is actually a more or less benevolent spirit who many believe remains in folk theater in order to protect others. Bessie was a leading actress notable for wearing the color red. Many now believe that she attempts to not let other leading ladies wear red in order to save them from her own fate. Reports have her being rather passive, with some specifics involving her moving objects around the stage, along with many members of the theater taking note of drastic temperature changes. Being overheated on stage, particularly under you know heavy costuming and intense lights, it's not uncommon when it comes to theaters and stage plays. 
However, these members and their accounts specifically point out that there are spots in the theater and on the stage that are extremely cold in comparison to the rest of the area. And that is something that take note on because there aren't any notable events and they couldn't find any like physical reasoning as to why there would be so many random cold spots that just sort of pop up when it, you should be overheated. Once more, Bessie is known to move objects pretty much throughout the theater, uh, along with closing doors that have been left ajar. She is also known for being seen within the tech booth, as well as other sections of the seating area, either in a humanoid figure or as a disembodied vapor. And people believe that when you were to see her in these sections, she's actually attempting to sit in and watch a rehearsal or a performance of some sort. Another member of the theater also known to linger on campus is being a former UT student by the name of Jennifer. She was a performing arts major who is still sometimes heard singing in Reeves Theater. Deaths also occur often on the campus throughout its history, like most institutes of higher education, especially with a longer lifespan, this is sort of unavoidable. Aside from Jennifer, her lover also supposedly passed away, both allegedly while on campus. A girl was also found dead in the Old uh, Lakes Cattle Barn in 1982, just rather close by to the campus. This girl was possibly believed to be a prostitute and had no actual affiliation to the campus itself, but the idea of someone dumping the body so close to campus did stir up a lot of fear especially since her killer was actually never found. Two fraternity brothers supposedly also passed away as well within a very short period of time while they were living in Plant Hall back when it was a dorm. So those are some notable deaths. However, I do want to point out that there isn't, aside from the woman who passed away in the 1980s, there isn't really any notable history when it comes to those other deaths. They're just sort of names. Like, they're just numbers essentially and there's really no substance behind knowing who those people were or if it actually happened but just keep that in mind because they're still known to have happened but no one actually knows any details which is weird or at least details are not public but with those two last ones occurring while they were living in plant hall that is a nice transition however before we do get into the building itself i do want to mention one tiny thing a lot of the sources that you might come across will also mention that a librarian or historian of the campus uh, by the name of Art Bagley also allegedly passed away from having a heart attack while leading a tour. However, this is not at all true. They say that it happened years and years ago and he was just having a tour and had a heart attack while doing it. That did not happen. Art is very much still alive. In fact, he actually recently retired from the university, so he's doing well that this just complete fabrication on whoever actually started that rumor but now that that's cleared up we can officially move into plant hall because again a lot of the stories do come from this location so within plant hall itself you'll likely see a rather active number of students faculty staff visitors during the day and on top of that there seems to be additional residents in the building that have never left Several individuals have reported having an eerie sensation while visiting the building, as though they might be watched. Something that seems to be understood and just agreed upon by everyone, that this building is sort of eerie, especially when it's nighttime. It's sort of known for being a place that you just don't frequent when it's dark. Students have reported the sensation of also being pushed while descending the stairs, also, doors have been reported to open and close on their own, and people will hear them in the distance. Those who visit the location have also reported hearing disembodied voices that are believed to be the long-dead servants back when the building was the Tampa Bay Hotel. The science department in particular, which was used as the staff's quarter, is said to have the sound of creaking cartwheels and clanging sounds almost as if metal was being banged during the dead of the night. In addition, the sound of dice being rolled can also be heard coming from the former gambling casino section. There also seems to be a phantom couple who continues to dance with one another within the building's former ballroom. Some also believe that the tall uh, minarets, the large tower-like structures that loom over the building, uh, may also house a few additional spirits. However, there aren't any real specifics about this. People just sort of 
think that. Students also report seeing the figure of a man with a darker complexion wearing a straw hat. It's believed that this spirit may be the former groundskeeper of the hotel of some sort. And people actually also believe that Teddy Roosevelt himself still lingers about the old hotel that he frequented in life. However, they don't really know that, and no one's actually reported seeing his spirit. They just sort of think that, again. But once more, there is a rather notable figure when it comes to the paranormal in this specific building. And the best known entity in Plant Hall is known by the Brown Man as he is described as a man wearing a brown suit. He is known to appear and vanish throughout the building, more specifically doing so around the building's grand staircase. Another discernible feature of the brown man's ghost is his piercing and glowing red eyes. One account has a woman visiting the museum section of the building with her husband, and while descending the stairway, she became extremely disoriented and cold. Furthermore, an unknown male voice whispered into her ear the words, Go ahead, why don't you just jump, over and over again. Without hesitation, the woman asked to leave, and apparently she never returned. Another story relates to a female student who came onto campus early with her father who happened to work in the university. Apparently he did maintenance, and they were in Plant Hall at this given day. So once more, it was extremely early in the morning between the uh, time of... 5 30 and 6 a.m when the female student decided to wander off and just explore the building during such a quiet time she found herself in the lobby staircase just similar to the woman before this specific staircase that i'm mentioning is the one actually closest to the museum side of the building so keep that in mind and she began to climb the stairs upon reaching the second floor landing she noticed a man who was dressed in an out-of-fashion three-piece suit, simply just standing there on the stairs. The girl, who again was a student and whose father worked within the building, she called out to the man, probably assuming that he was someone who worked there or whatnot, just trying to say hello. The man, however, remained completely silent, but soon began to walk down towards her. This was when the student was able to notice that his eyes were glowing bright red. She quickly fled the scene, and only upon being told the story of the brown man, pieced together that she may have actually spotted him. Another student was also supposedly a witness of the brown man, once again within the same stairwell as the others. This time the student was actually walking down the stairs when they spotted a man in a brown suit sitting on the corner of the landing. They were able to briefly pass the man on their way down, and they noticed that he was drinking what appeared to be a cup of tea, but within the exact same instance, the man simply vanished before their eyes. These claims, however, uh, do not have any notable names attached to them. All are either anonymous, or they have simply just been passed around so often that they've become well-known enough. This pretty much goes for the brown man himself and the stories relating to him. There aren't too many credible or detailed claims relating to his spirit and sightings that people may have of him, but he has become rather infamous with Plant Hall itself and has become a sort of campus-wide boogeyman that students know about, but no one's really claiming anything from. But it's still interesting to think that the campus has its own sort of shadowy figure looming in the dark. Now the final building that I do want to briefly mention only because it does have a few more notable claims, more I guess more frequent ones, uh, and that is the Student Union. This building was constructed on the foundation of a former hotel ga uh, gaming hall, which was burned down back in 1941. Nowadays, if you're there late in the evening, both students and staff members have reported hearing casino-like sounds. So I'm assuming that means slot machines, people laughing, like stuff like that. Along with this, once more, the sound of dice being rolled can oftentimes be heard. And this all centers around the building's two-story cafeteria area known as the CAF. So if you are there and you are a student or something, you want to check it out. Apparently, this is another epicenter spot within the campus. But with that, that really wraps up what about most of the stories with the spirits inspectors within the university. 
The campus, again, is extremely small. It's only really a few buildings, and we discussed a rather sizable amount of them. And uh, like mentioned earlier, the student body is only around like 9,000 individuals. Yet despite all of this, there seems to be a rather large presence of otherworldly individuals who still seem to linger about the buildings. And uh, I just find it interesting. Uh, I unfortunately was not able to visit the campus myself when my brother went down there, but uh, I definitely do hope to maybe someday see it. Plain Hall is a rather interesting building, and it's beautiful in its architecture, and I'm sure it would be interesting to explore at night if that's allowed. But I will be wrapping this up. I hope you guys did enjoy this episode, and if you do want to check out new episodes, be sure to follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you want to, and leave a review if you did enjoy. I do possibly want to do some more university episodes, so if you guys have any suggestions for that, you can leave that uh, with me over on Twitter or Instagram at Realm of Unknown, or email me at realmofunknown at gmail.com. If you also do want to support the podcast, you could do so by checking out the Patreon. And again, just like earlier in the episode, be sure to go and check out a Three Spook Girls podcast if you are interested in similar topics and discussions. So be sure to go check them out, and I hope to see you guys next time. Remember to stay spooky.